Hello, and welcome back to EGR360. Uh, today we're going to be talking about DFM and DFA. Okay, um, There are a lot of different terms that actually go into this. Uh, I'm going to try to keep this a little simpler so that we can focus more on what is how to apply these principles rather than what they are. So first of all, let's, let's go ahead and say, what is DFM? DFM stands for Design for Manufacturer. Okay, and there's a lot of different principles that go along uh, with DFM. So if I say DFM, I mean the following questions. Can a part be made. Okay. But also, can it be made using the process that's supposed to make it? Okay. And we'll talk a little bit about this right now. Um, the book has a lot of wearing mask. Uh, the book has a lot of different pieces to DFM that it discusses. Uh, so we'll break this down a little bit. Okay. Now this is going to seem a little pedantic, but quite frankly, this is a little eye opening for most engineers. It was for me. Let's say I have a part, I'm going to make a solid cube. And in this solid cube, I'm going to create a rectangular hole that goes all the way through it. Okay. Now the question is, how can I manufacture this piece? Well, we have a couple of operations. We have drilling. We have milling. Uh, we have uh, turning, which is like lathe work. Um, or reverse lathe work, which is another one where you have the bits spinning around. Uh, you have additive manufacturing, which is 3D printing. Uh, you have um, you have die casting. Uh, those are two words, uh, and then you have extrusion. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of other manufacturing processes that's, that can be used. So let's let's go ahead and break through each one of these. Okay, if we were going to start out with this piece, then it starts out with where is how is the stock piece going to come in? Is it going to be a larger square? Because if that's the case, then drilling isn't is not even an option at all. Um, we could mill around the outsides and get a, a smaller shape. So milling would be how we could get the outsides. Now the insides, you can't use milling for. One of the things that milling and drilling do is they take a rotating bit that has a cutting edge on it, and they drop it down into a material, and they cut off chips of the material on the edges of that rotating bit, okay? Problem is, this creates a circular profile. Similar to turning, milling, and drilling, all of these are used to create circular profiles. Uh, there are advanced tools with beveled edges that can be used at various angles to actually cut straight lines. Those are very expensive, and quite frankly, you're, you're poorly using your equipment if that's what you require to make a square hole. So looking at just the limitations of these three operations, we can only do something circular. Having a square hole in here, if it's okay that the edges are rounded, we could do that with a combination of milling and drilling. Uh, you could even do it with a combination of milling, drilling, and turning. Uh, because all turning is, is, is uh, you put the piece down and it's sideways. It's basically sideways milling and drilling. Or you turn the piece itself and you keep the bit stable. Um, it's just reversing the operation there. Uh, so as we look at this, how can we make this? If this square hole, if it's okay to make it rounded, we can mill that out instead. We can, we'll drop a drill bit in each of these four corners and then mill out the rest and we're done. We're good. That's it. 
We have satisfied creating this piece and we can do that with a combination of milling and drilling. Okay, good. Um, turning, I mean, you could do the same thing with turning as well. We could also do this with additive manufacturing. Now, principles of additive manufacturing, unlike drilling, milling, and turning, where it requires a set amount of, it has to be a circular hole, has to be something where, you know, you can't have, if, if you had a hole in the middle of this that was not accessible on the outsides, you can't do that with drilling, milling, and turning because all three of them require you to insert a cutting blade into your material. So as a result, these require a hole that has access from the outside. And it requires that that hole is rounded, okay? So anytime you, you try to make something and you're going to use any of these three operations, has to be round, has to be accessible from the outside. Additive manufacturing adds a different level of complexity here because additive manufacturing allows for a few very different methods of manufacturing now, okay? The way that an additive manufacturing works, uh, this is a very general description, is layer by layer, a piece is built up on itself to form a complex geometry, okay? Um, there are limitations to additive manufacturing. Just like there were limitations to drilling, milling, and turning, there are limitations to additive manufacturing, okay? In additive manufacturing, you could create a void in the center of this object. It is possible. Uh, so that is one thing that drilling, milling, and turning cannot do. You can also create hard edges. You can create very complex uh, geometries and you can do it fairly rapidly. But the issue with additive manufacturing is, let's say I wanna create a ship bow that looks like this, okay? Now I'm going to build up the pieces from the bottom up. Well, now I have this giant overhang where this piece is being added to air. There's nothing underneath it. In additive manufacturing today, we oftentimes have to print support material that'll go under here so that we have something to print on because it has to be printed on something. We can't just extend it out over air. Um, it does mean that having a void like this, what we would have to have is we would have to have some holes somewhere. Uh, you put in a soluble support material and then you dip it in a hot vat and that soluble support material will melt out, leaving that void in the center. That's what's required. Uh, you would have to have some method for that material to then escape because you can't simply make an empty space in additive manufacturing. Okay. So, and actually we currently have no way of making an empty space inside of something without having, you, you can shape the geometry so that it looks like this. This is actually something that you can 3D print because while you're every new layer is being printed over air, it's close enough to the other side that it's not, it, it'll still stick to itself. So you could create this type of geometry as a void in a solid material, but that's about it. Okay. So additive manufacturing, you have to be careful about as it builds up layers, you're not expanding out further than what you have. Additive manufacturing also has a limitation on the types of materials it can be used on. Whereas drilling, milling, and turning can be used on plastics, woods, metals, glasses, silicates. Uh, it, it can be used on even concrete. Um, additive manufacturing, it requires a liquid material of some kind. We have created additive manufacturing processes that will center tin. Uh, it'll actually melt the tin and use it as an additive manufacturing. But when you get into like higher materials like steel, uh, we don't have the ability to 3D print those nicely. Yes, okay, you could forge them, melt them, have a giant vat of molten steel and then try to use that in a 3D printing process. You could try to build something like that and it would be amazing, but uh, it's also very expensive and it would take a lot of time and uh, not really sure if that's gonna help you all that much, okay? But we do have ones for light metals like tin. Uh, we do have added manufacturing obviously for the plastics. We have those in our lab. 
Uh, we do have additive manufacturing for liquid concrete. Uh, there's, we have the ability to print concrete. We have additive manufacturing for pancakes. Anything that can be liquid and then become solid, we have additive manufacturing for. Uh, one of the beauties of, of recent advancements in additive manufacturing is the idea of a resin that hardens in the presence of UV light. So here, if you have a resin and you play UV light on it in certain ways, you can create very interesting geometries out of that resin and then extract the resin uh, out. So that's an opportunity. Additive manufacturing has changed the way we traditionally manufacture because now instead of looking at, okay, it has to be circular or instead of looking at the other, other forming methods, uh, we now are solving a different problem and we can get different results out of it. So, um, but if you're going to design for something to be manufactured using this method, you need to make sure that it doesn't have empty spaces. Die casting, what that is, is you create a cast. Um, sometimes it's using sand or sand casting. Um, and you have, maybe you want your part to look like this. Okay. So you'll have two pieces that'll clamp onto each other. Um, and then you will dump in whatever liquid material you're using, whether that's iron or steel or uh, aluminum, um, cast aluminum, something like, uh, like this, which is all cast as a solid piece. Um, what you, what you'll see is that it's, it's a very rough outside, but it was probably sand casted. It had a couple of pieces that were put in here and then everything else is just cut out of it. Okay. But you pour that liquid material in here, let it harden, and then you break open the cast. Uh, some of the casts are sacrificial. What that means is that like in sand casting, you don't expect to get the sand back. Um, but some of them are more uh, permanent. In a lot of injection molding, which is uh, casting just with plastic, uh, in that you oftentimes will use metal molds that do not get sacrificed. So it does increase the cost of making the mold, but it preserves the lifespan of that mold and lets you make a lot of pieces in a short amount of time. Now, the thing about casting that you have to be careful for is you have to have a continuous path from where the material is inserted to where the material ends up. And one of the issues is, let's say if we're looking at a top view of here, if I have this piece and I want to go really super thin and then go out, it's going to take a lot of pressure for us to push, to push material through this very thin gap. And that's an issue with casting. Okay. Because if this, this is filled with air before we don't create a vacuum in here, which means when we're done, if this is still filled with air, our cast is going to look terrible. So we have to be careful about the thin features. We may need to create a very specific nozzle that takes material and specifically injects it into this chamber so that these two areas meet in the middle and we're not trying to shove material into here and extract the air out all with the same tube. Okay, so in here, any thin features, you need to make sure that you have sufficient pressure that you can actually inject into the thin features, but you also need to make sure that you have the ability to extract the air back out if there are chambers associated with that. So those are some of the considerations you have to make with casting. Okay, uh, extrusion is another method. Uh, quite frankly, this is one of the dumbest methods. The idea here is you have a roller and you have a material that's coming in to your roller and your rollers just simply won't allow the materials to go through unless they're being squished. Okay, so here if you come in with a much larger diameter tube, you can smash this through the process of extrusion, just rolling it through. Uh, you can call it hot rolling it, you heat the material up, you roll it through. Every time it goes through a pair of rollers, it'll lose like four ten thousandths uh, of an inch off of it. Uh, because it has to be a very gradual rolling. And as you continue rolling down, uh, then you can get it from this much larger shape down to this shape. Now, again, this has limitations. It's only for creating flat surfaces. Uh, I guess you can do it with tubes as well. Um, but 
It's really only for circular or flat shapes, and it is to change the dimensions relative to each other, squishing, that type of thing. So every one of our manufacturing processes, and there are more, uh, but every one of them has its own limitations. So when we look at design for manufacture, we have to consider what is going to be used to actually make the part that I want to have made. If I want to have a hole cut in a part, how can I make that hole? Okay, is it going to be drilled in? Drilling is pretty easy. If it's going to be drilled in, and if you're going to drill a hole in, you have to make sure that there is nothing above or below that hole that's going to be impacted by your drill bit. Because if, if you have a part like this, okay, or let's say it goes out like this even, and you want a hole here, but you do not want a hole here or here, you can't do that with a drill bit. Because the drill bit has to be able to be inserted into that part, and it's going to cut through the other piece of that. So this is what we think of when we say design for manufacture. We are designing so that the part can be possibly made. Some of this is learned through experience. A lot of this is learned by talking to technicians. Okay, Technicians know how to make stuff better than you do. They will always know how to make stuff better than you do. Uh, you can be the world's greatest engineer, and technicians will still know more. A good engineer values their technicians, because their technicians know this is friggin' dumb. Trying to insert a bolt into a hole like that? It's a nightmare. Yeah, that's like 1990s automobile technology right there. It sucks. Okay, so that's design for manufacture. Design for assembly is a very similar principle. Okay, the goal here with design for assembly which is what DFA is. Can a uh, system be assembled? Okay. If it can be assembled, you have satisfied DFA principles. Simply put. Now there are ways of making this simpler. Let's say I've got um, a piece that looks like this and I need to be bolting it on to um, a square piece that also has two bolt holes. Okay, these line up. The idea is put this here, put the bolts holes through. If we look at these two pieces, the problem is if your piece up here has bolt hole here and here, here and here, and the piece down here has, so I'll just, nope, I'm gonna do it the other way. So here's the hole, here's the material. So these are the holes. And let's say our holes are here and here, and here and here. Okay, and then this is the material. The problem is these holes are now not aligned. I can't stick two bolts through this material. If I put one in, it's going to cause this top piece to shift a little bit, and then this will be even worse trying to stick a bolt through there. But if I get a small enough bolt, I can fit through both holes. So this brings about the idea of tolerancing. Okay, the idea with tolerancing is create um, gaps. Uh, reduce, what, what is it that's an acceptable level for a hole so that these two parts can mate nicely. Okay, when you get into tolerancing, that's where you get into quality control. If a part is properly toleranced, it will guarantee that the bolts will fit in every time. Okay, you'll have a hole where the tolerance is, uh, it can be a certain size to a certain size. And that's all that tolerancing is. You make the bolt holes larger, then these bolts will be able to fit in. Okay, and all tolerancing is, is just creating space for error. So if these two parts are a little bit off, it's not going to cause it to not work. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect in order for these parts to mate together. Okay, um, so tolerancing is a big aspect of design for assembly. Another thing in design for assembly is you have to make sure parts are assembled linearly. Okay, let's say you have an axle that you've designed that looks like this. Okay, 
in this axle, and you have a gear that you want to put right in the middle, all right? Well, the diameter of the axle right in the middle is thin, a diameter of the axle right next to it is thick. Now the idea is that it's not going to, your gear is not going to move. Well, problem is, you don't have a gear that you could insert onto this that unless it has an inner diameter of this. Now if the inner diameter is this, then it can slide over these giant humps, but now it doesn't even fit on that part. You can't fit a gear that has an inner diameter of this onto that piece. It's impossible. It's just geometry. You can't take this piece from here and shove it into this position without going through this material. So what you would have to do is you would have to design this shaft so that it only has one side that's available and then this would this gear would have to be slid on from this side and then you would have to clamp on something onto the outside to do what you wanted there for that shaft. Okay, that's designed for assembly. It is making sure that parts can actually get together. So designed for manufacture, designed for assembly, they're critical, but it takes an understanding of the manufacturing process. As we move through this book, we're gonna be talking about different manufacturing processes such as milling, drilling, turning, injection molding, casting. We're gonna be talking about different types of materials and how this works. Um, because the better you understand how to manufacture something, how to assemble something, the more likely you are to apply DFA and DFM materials. And this is the most important thing you can possibly get out of this class. I'll say that again because that's going to be a quiz question. It's the most important thing you're going to get out of this class.